Thank you all for having me again today. My name is Jeff Pennington. I'm actually a member of the third quarter class, which meets in here before you get in here. We're the ones that are constantly causing you to come in late. <coughs> I'd like to apologize for them, but I know it's not going to do any good. Uh, they'd like to talk and gossip and, oh, excuse me, not gossip. <laughs> but um, <coughs> anyway, I appreciate the opportunity today to um, to be with you and when Butch told me uh, what my topic was he looked at me and he said I'm doing I want you to do Isaiah 28 29 and I thought to myself I, I have done a single verse before I can probably stretch that out to 40 or 45 minutes and then he looked at me and he says no not Isaiah 28 29 you're doing chapters 28 and 29 <laughs> So I've prepared about two and a half hours of material. Uh, the good news is we're going to take a short break between hour one and the beginning of hour two. So I just want to set expectations. Um, <clears throat> introducing this, uh, these two chapters, um, it's interesting to me that you know the pastor of our church gets to do the minor prophets. I get to do one of the major prophets, so I think we understand who, where I rank in the pecking order, okay? So Isaiah 28 and 29, it's an extended message from God to Isaiah, uh, who was one of God's prophets, and it's intended as a lesson for the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, however, God is teaching this lesson by focusing on the sin of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. And at this time, the tribes, the 12 tribes, had broken into two parts. The 10 of the tribes had gone north, and that became Israel. And the other two tribes stayed in the south, and that was Judah. Um, this message is essentially going to go on for eight chapters, and so I'm covering essentially the first two which is establishing, I think, the current context of why God is even bringing his word to the, the Jews who are in uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, <clears throat> when I looked at these chapters, one of the things that uh, struck me was when I was growing up, my dad used to always tell me, a wise man learns from his own mistakes, a wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. I never took that to heart. Um, I made all of my own mistakes anyway, but these two chapters are essentially God's way of attempting to reach Judah with a lesson by showing what is going to happen to the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and as usual with the, the Israelites of this time is that they've lost sight of God um, they come out of the wilderness, but they no longer see God as being a refuge or, or a resource. And he's using the anguish that that causes them and the, their sin, uh, essentially through Isaiah, to bring prophecies to his people. And I, when I read these two chapters, I think that the tone I got, the feel I got, was that this was really kind of a stern but loving father who was starting the discipline process with his children. Um, and you're going to see that as we kind of go through these verses. Since you all were so good at reading congregationally, we're going to read all of chapter 28 and all of chapter 29 out loud together. I'm kidding. <laughs> Could you imagine how hard that would be? <clears throat> so starting in verse 28, or chapter 28, Verse 1 says, Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, of those who are overcome with wine. So essentially, he starts by saying woe. So you know this is not a, a positive situation. And it's to the drunkards of Ephraim. Ephraim is another name for Israel. So, uh, again, one of the things that I found in reading Isaiah is, as, as is usual with prophets, the language is very cryptic, it's not very clear, 
They make allegories and they use parables and they use comparison sentences which you really have to pay attention to to understand what's actually being said. So Ephraim is just another name for Israel. So we're talking about the northern kingdom. And the proud crown of Ephraim is the capital city, which is Samaria. Now, this city overlooks a, a series of lush vineyards. Um, I find it interesting that he's about to talk about the drunkards of Ephraim. And yet they're situated in the center of a, a large number of vineyards. And sort of the first thing that came to my mind is if you're tempted by sin, maybe one of the first things to do is move away from the place where that pin, temptation might actually be, uh, might actually exist. Even though that's not really my lesson today. That was one of the things that I thought about as I, as I read these words. And what you see here is that he's talking to the people of Israel that have lost sight of who they are in God. And their sin is basically that they are filled with wine and revelry and debauchery. That's one of the things that you'll see that are consistent between not only what is happening with Israel in the northern kingdom, but also with Judah in the southern kingdom. Some background context, just so you understand where we are. Assyria is currently in, uh, they had conquered Israel, and so they're, they're in charge of the government, they're in charge of what goes on in the northern kingdom. Uh, but their king has let Israel have autonomy in the sense that they have to pay a tribute or a tax, but he's allowing them to essentially govern themselves. He's not, a, he's not being strict in terms of the rules and the regulations that the, cap, uh, that the nation of Assyria uh, requires when it conquers people. Um, but Israel became proud and they boasted of their independence and now what you're seeing is they're refusing to pay that tax or that tribute. And they're engaging in parties and revelry and debauchery. And um, I'm sure for the people of our world, um, this sounds like a lot of fun, but um, God is not well pleased. And I think what you're gonna see is he's beginning to address that sin and Isaiah is the bearer of the bad news. Verses two through four. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty agent. As a storm of hail, a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters, he has cast it down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is the head of the fertile valley, will be like the first ripe, ripe fig prior to summer which one sees, and as soon as it is in his hand, he swallows it. So one of the things we see here is that God is telling Israel, he's telling Isaiah and the people of Judah, that Israel is ripe for judgment. Um, Assyria, in this case, is the mighty agent that God is going to use to smite them down. And one of the things that he's going to allow is essentially a reconquering of Israel, that the lax um, standards that the king of, of Assyria has allowed, that's no longer going to be the case, and they're going to ravage uh, the nation of Israel again. Um, and he uses the image of a ripe and juicy fig that is plucked from the tree and immediately eaten. I didn't really, that didn't resonate with me very much because I don't like figs, but I thought about peanut M&Ms hanging from a tree and had I passed that tree, the first thing that would happen is I would have picked a bunch of those off and they would e immediately have been consumed. And so what he's saying is, is it's, it's time for Israel to face the judgment, to face the music. And he's going to raise up the Assyrians to once again smite Israel. <clears throat> but this again, reminder, is just it, this is a stern warning for Judah. He's allowing the, the people of Judah to learn from the mistakes of Israel. Although, uh, I think we know that that will not uh, actually take place. Verses 5 and 6. In that day the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the rem remnant of his people. A spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment. A strength 
to those who repel the onslaught at the gate. So while the first four verses are really kind of setting up a gloomy, uh, doom-like outcome for Israel, one of the things that God is going to acknowledge is, is there's an actual remnant of people who have stayed faithful to, to God and to his teaching. Um, and it reminded me of kind of our nation today. Um, if you think about this, America is slowly but surely tending towards being very much like Israel if we haven't already arrived there. But we, as believers in Christ, are to be that remnant, to hold on to the teaching of the Word, to hold on to the Holy Spirit, to, to be humble. You're going to, we were in the um, service earlier, and, and Pastor Greg was talking about righteousness and justice, and that's what the remnant is desirous of. And God is going to reward the people who remain faithful to Him. Um, this remnant was grievously injured by the actions of the rest of the people in Israel. They watched as parties took place, as people became drunk on wine, as I'm sure other sins were committed. Um, and they were very upset by the fact that um, these people had not stayed faithful to God after being led out of captivity after being led out of Egypt. Um, and one of the things I think you'll see is they begin to rejoice when God begins to move in judgment. And it's not so much because they desire the, the actions that are going to come down on the people of Israel. It's more that they are, they are desirous of God's justice. They want to see God reinstated. They want to see his mighty hand at work. And they want to see that justice prevail as it relates to Israel. And Isaiah is warning the people of Judah, essentially, that um, they're next if they don't shape up. <clears throat> but one of the things that occurred to me when I, I got to these chapters is it, it's a reminder that God is not just a God of love. He is also a God of judgment. And, and one of the things that I'm not sure of, at least in my generation, is, is that we have the necessary awe to remember that God's hand is mighty and it is powerful and that he will bring judgment down on the generations that choose to not abide by his teachings, by his word, by the, allowing the Holy Spirit to work. And while he is a God of love, he's balanced by the sense of, of anger and righteous justice that he can bring down upon a people, as he's proving here with the people of Israel and subsequently with the people of Judah. If he were only a God of love, I think what you'd see is he would be a God that was too permissive. Um, parents are like that. Um, these helicopter parents who gave everything to their kids, uh, you now see a generation of people who, who think that Everything is, they deserve everything that they can grab without actually having to work for that. So you don't want a God that is too permissive. But on the other, other hand, we, don't, we would not respond well to a God who is too cold or impersonal or vengeful. And so I think it's that balance, which is why um, we become believers in Christ and why we follow the living God. Verses 7 and 8, And these also reel with wine and stagger, stagger from strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. You notice there's a theme here of strong drink. I don't know about you. Um, when I became a deacon in this church, I stopped drinking because the pastor asked, asked that that be a condition of service as being part of the deacon's body. And I didn't become a believer until I was 33 years of age. So strong drink was a part of my life for some years prior to that. But I can tell you, I don't miss uh, alcohol at all. And I uh, haven't had a drink since uh, 1990 when I became a, a deacon. But clearly, uh, we're dealing with people here who see alcohol as, as a 
part of their lives, is a part of their activity, is part of their entertainment. Um, I think you see in the world today that alcohol and drugs have become a very large part of the entertainment situation or complex. Um, and so even though this is written about Israel and Judah, there are great um, connections, if you will, with, the, with our generation today. We need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. So God here is turning his attention from the people to the religious leaders and priests who are also staggered from strong drink. It's not just the regular rabble, if you will, that have lost sight of God. It's also the people who are in charge, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, the people who are in leadership are just as uh, guilty of indulging in strong drink and parties and revelry, and, and Isaiah is calling them out. One of the things that, con that I saw in this is they consumed drink but they were also swallowed by drink. That drink became a part of their existence, that it was part of their daily life. And um, this is a, a, a difficult spiral, downward spiral to get out of. I have several relatives that are alcoholics and it is incredibly difficult to watch their behavior they can pull themselves out for a period of time but it is almost invariably um, guaranteed that they will find themselves back in there, back in a situation where alcohol becomes the ruling factor. And so that's essentially the situation we're seeing here with Israel. Um, and rather than set an example, these leaders, they're joining in the revelry and the sin, and in many cases are actually leading the parties that are taking place. And I think what you see is God begins to get graphic in describing their places of revelry. He talks about vomit on the tables. I'm sure he could go into more detail, um, but I think you get the, the point. <clears throat> Verse 9, to whom would he teach knowledge and to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just taken from the breast? For he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. I got to tell you, it took me a while to figure out what was being said here. Um, I think what you see is it's now the context is switching from Isaiah talking to the leaders to the leaders now talking back to Isaiah. And what they're saying is, is hey, who are you to lecture us? Who are you, a simple prophet, as Greg talked about, just a man of, behind God's own heart, who, who are you to talk to us about our sin? Um, does he believe that the leaders are stupid and naive? Um, does he believe they don't have their own superior knowledge of God? They're rebellious. They begin to mock Isaiah. They suggest that, uh, that what they hear is simply noise, simply babble is gibberish. Those lines um, where it says order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there, that's talking about the fact that uh, Isaiah is just going on and on and on and they're not, they're not understanding anything that he's saying. They don't see any value in anything that he's saying. <clears throat> and lest we judge too harshly, um, the question I ask myself is, is how often do we question the Word of God? And how often do we trust to our superior judgment? Where instead of listening to God, listening to the Holy Spirit, it just comes across as noise. It just comes across as babble to us because either one, we have our own will and we don't want God interfering in that. Or true, two, we've not done a sufficient job of being in God's Word to even understand what He's trying to teach us. Either one of those are not situations that I would like to find myself in, lest I fall into the camp of the Israelites. 
11 and 13, Indeed, he will speak to his people through stammering lips in a foreign tongue. He who said to them, Here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they would not listen. And so the word of the Lord to them will be order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there, that they may go and stumble backward, be broken, snared, and taken captive. So God's reaction to this mockery, if you will, is going to be that the Assyrians are going to come in and restore order in the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, They're going to take away the rights that the Israelites had. Um, No longer will it simply be a tribute or a tax. They're going to be a conquered people. And then God reminded them that when he spoke in the past, he spoke of repose. He spoke of rest that those who follow God have the ability to claim that. And instead, by not following him, they're not going to see rest. They're not going to see repose. Instead, they're going to see war, anarchy. They're going to see death and destruction. And we're going to see the word um, scourge come up, which is what's going to happen to the nation of Israel. He says, I will give you rest. The weary may come to me, and I will keep your enemies from you. Um, But they would not listen again. Ironically, now we're at the point where God says his word will be order on order, line on line. That it will be gibberish. It will be noise. It will be like a clanging cymbal. It will be like um, just simple gibberish that these people will not be able to understand what Isaiah and or God will say to them because they have moved so far away from him. And he says they will go and stumble backward and be taken captive. You know, to me, this is a pretty sad message. Um, He says, I told my people how to find rest and safety, but they wouldn't listen to that. Instead, they chose their own path. They chose to go down a different road. And so now what's going to happen is he's going to use a much different communication method to get his point across. And what I took away from that is in my own life, how often do I not abide by the offering or the comfort that God provides instead going my own direction? And the question is, at what point does God say enough is enough and now I will bring consequences to your life because my lesson will be learned. It's not a function of if, it's a function of when, and it's a function of what I have to do in order for you to learn that lesson. So for us, I think what we take away is we're much better off if we believe and abide by the promises of God and we take at face value that when he says that he is a God of rest and he is a God of refuge and safety, That's where we need to go. Does that make sense? So starting in verse 11, it says, Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, Here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they would not listen. So the word of the Lord to them will be order on order. We talked about that. So moving to verse um, 14. um, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers. Um, Who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. And with Shoal, we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, and we have conceded, concealed ourselves uh, with deception. Therefore, says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation. Firmly placed, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. Then hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the secret place. Your covenant with death will be canceled and your pact with shoal will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you become its trampling place. 
As often as it passes through, it will seize you. For morning after morning, it will pass through any time during the day or night, and it will be sheer terror to understand what it means. I didn't have any trouble understanding those words. Basically, God's about to bring the hammer down on the nation of Israel. And um, he talks about it in some depth that they have no protection. Um, that <clears throat> until they learn this lesson, they will be subject to whatever discipline, whatever torment, whatever God chooses to bring into their life. Um, and this is also now where Isaiah is beginning to address directly his own people, saying, look, this, we are subject to some of these same conditions, and we are likely to begin to face some of the same consequences that the northern kingdom is facing. And he specifically calls out the scoffers who rule the people. And I couldn't help but think about our nation today. And I mean, the level of scoffing that goes on um, about a number of things, but certainly about the Christian faith, about those of us who are believers. Um, it's just amazing to me that you see more and more and more of this again I liken this to the fact that we begin to look very much like the northern kingdom is of Israel before God starts his judgment process. He also talks about those who made a covenant with death. And essentially what this means is he's talking about plans that the Israelites have for their own protection that have nothing to do with God. And what he's saying is, is none of your plans that do not include me ever have a chance of living or breathing or actually coming to fruition. So it's called a covenant of death. <clears throat> They're using this covenant in order to try to avoid the scourge that's about to happen. And it says that this is where their lives are their refuge. Um, I'm thinking about this political campaign that's going on and I don't know if a single true word is being spoken at all anywhere in any of the ads in any of the the um, the campaign events it's just lie after lie after lie um, and this is one of the things that also happened with the northern kingdom of Israel is that they use lies to uh, keep the people away from God and in falsehood they have taken shelter. And, but God says, Behold, however, I am laying a stone in Zion. And here's the interesting thing. It says your covenant will be annulled. And to me, that was the lesson for my own life, which is when I choose to go outside of God in my planning, in my walk, when I choose to use my own will, sooner or later my covenant either with myself, with those around me who are not also following God's will, my covenant eventually will be annulled. That those plans will go by the wayside and God will re-exert himself into my life. And again, wise men learn from their own mistakes, but wiser men learn from the mistakes of others. This is the, the, the lesson that I think Isaiah is trying to teach us where the Holy Spirit is by having us look at chapters 28 and 29. So no matter how you try to avoid it, uh, these consequences are going to come. Specifically, though, in verse 16, I want to go back to that one verse. It says, Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. So what we're seeing here is, is that this is a prophecy about the forthcoming life of Jesus. Uh, the stone in Zion is Jesus. It says he's a tested stone. Um, he's a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. In 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8, it says that he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who are disobedient. So in future generations, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to be that element of, uh, of testing us, of holding us accountable for who we are as believers in the kingdom. 
Today, it's God. It's the prophets who are delivering that word. But in the future, Jesus will be that cornerstone. He'll be the sure foundation. And he will be that stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for those who, who will not believe um, in God. It says here, he who believes will not be in a hurry. And at first I wasn't sure what that meant, but I think what that says is, if you think about it, those who believe in, in Jesus will not be anguished. We will have peace. We will have comfort. Um, we will not have anxiety. Um, we'll, we won't be anxious about our life, or we shouldn't be anxious about our life. I know we often are, but... Uh, to the extent that we follow in the footsteps of Christ and are his disciples, anxiety should be one of the things that gets removed from us over time. Um, so it says he will not be in a hurry, but I think if you refer back to verse 12, what he's saying here is, is that those who believe will have rest and they'll have security and they'll have safety and a place to repose. Make sense? 21 and 22, for the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeon to do his task, his unusual task, and to work his work, his extraordinary work. And now do not carry on as scoffers, or your fetters will be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts of decisive destruction on all the earth. <clears throat> So it says here that the Lord will rise up to his extraordinary work of judgment. It's not a, a function of if, it's a matter of when. And even though Isaiah doesn't tell them when, uh, we're going to see in a few minutes that he uses a word that says it's imminent, that this prophecy is imminent. And Isaiah is really now, again, speaking to the people of Judah, um, trying to get them to... Um, to understand that what is happening in, um, in the northern kingdom is very likely to happen in the southern kingdom. And it says, do not carry on as non-believers or your chains will be made stronger. And I think this is a reference to the fact that those who dwell in sin are going to be destroyed by that sin. That the bonds only become stronger by not turning to Christ, not turning to him uh, in saving faith. And that... This is one of the things that he's reminding Judah and Israel both, that by not following the Lord God, your chains are only going to get heavier and stronger. Your imprisonment is only going to be longer, uh, more dire, and that at some point in time, judgment is coming. And so to finish off the chapter, um, 23 through 29, give ear and hear my voice, listen and hear my words. Does the farmer plow continually to plant seed? Does he continually turn and harrow the ground? Does he not level its surface and sow dill and scatter cumin and plant wheat and rose, barley in its place and rye within its area? For his God instructs and teaches him properly. For dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel driven over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a club. Grain for bread is crushed. Indeed, he does not continue to thresh it forever, because the wheel of his cart and his horses eventually damage it. He does not thresh it longer. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. And so what you see here, these last chapter, these last verses are a parable. And um, if you lived in an agrarian society, you would understand that he's using farming terms to talk about, in this case, he's talking about judgment. He's talking about how God brings judgment upon his people. And the work of judgment is like this parable. And what you see is first there are warnings through the prophets. So Isaiah is the first step in God's judgment raining down on Israel. And he's warning them. He's giving them a chance to repent. He's giving them a chance to turn their face away from drunkenness, from revelry, from the sin that has gripped the people. Um, second thing that happens is, is that once that warning has been ignored, 
then he begins to bring actions. And, in, and when you talk about farming, it could be a drought, it could be plagues, it could be crop failure, it could be equipment failure, it could be things that allow the, the harvest to be impacted, the harvest to be destroyed. And once again, that is ignored, and again, if you think about um, Pharaoh, how many plagues did he ignore before eventually God said, I'm taking my people? And so here what you see is, is that eventually what happens, full judgment um, rains down upon the people. And <clears throat> this ought to frighten us as believers in Christ because we, we do have a God of judgment. We do have a God that, that looks at who we are, looks at our heart, looks at our actions, and at some point in time, judgment can come down on us just like it can on those who are not believers in Christ. Might be different judgment. Um, we might get more time. Um, the initial actions might be less destructive. I don't know that for sure. Um, but eventually judgment will come if we choose not to follow the tenets and the teachings of Christ. So let's turn to chapter 29. Do you have a question yeah. before we go to the next chapter? Sure. Um, I'm surprised we didn't reference in connection to the cornerstone. That's Psalm 118, 22. The stone the builders rejected has been made head of the corner. People saw it and marveled at it. And then this is the day with the Savior having come that the Lord has made us rejoice. So that is the obvious reference that's quoted again in another scripture and uh, in, the, in the gospel and in Acts. You know, so that's a major thing that is messianic. Everybody accepts that as right. presaging uh, Christ. Right. Another one is, uh, you know, the drunkards there. It, it says proud drunkards in the first line of that chapter and later. And so what I get out of that is not entirely about alcohol. I think what Isaiah is saying is that these people are like drunkards. They're stumbling around in the dark, bumping into walls. They're not paying attention to what God wants in their life. So even though they may be having a carpe diem, live for the day attitude about it, it sounds like to me what he's really condemning is pride. And only, you know, there could be both, you know, but the Bible, you know, Christ's first miracle is, is making wine out of foot washing water. And then one of the sacraments of the church is wine. So wine per se is not, my dad was a minister and he said, I'm not gonna drink because somebody may think right. that I have a problem and I want people to trust me. But that was why, and also he was in AA and he saw the bad side of this, you know. But. Uh, yeah, I, I think you bring up fair points. Um, <clears throat> one of the dangers of somebody much younger than you all coming into this class, you know more about this than I do. Uh, I, I'm kidding about being much younger. Uh, but uh, I think you're exactly right about the reference in Psalm. Uh, we're going to see in Mark, for example, that uh, some of these verses in 29 are requoted. Uh, Mark uses this to talk about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes. Um, the drunkenness, I think it's fair to say that pride and other issues were there, but he also talks about the vomit on the table. So he is clearly also talking about the fact that many of these people get drunk. And wine, per se, is not the issue. It's drunkenness. Including um, their religious leaders. Or including the leaders of the people. They were just as inebriated and, and reveling and partying and into all hours of the night. And so I, I, I think you're right. There were other sins that were going on. Um, but because of the, the, the emphasis on the tables and, the, and what was left, the detritus, if you will, of these parties, I think drunkenness was very clearly a dimension. What, what you've got to understand is the northern kingdom, Samaria and everything, has already fallen, you know, before a couple of decades before the end of his life. So Isaiah is pre-exiled, we say, because we're talking about Judah, 
Judea. But he's not pre-exiled as to the northern kingdom. And you know the story in between Sennacherib marches his 180,000 up to the, almost the gates of Jerusalem, and he tells them, no, it's going to fail, and then they all die. Right. You know that story. So they don't conquer Jerusalem, and that's where Zion is. We understand that. So you've got to understand that right. to see where you are in, in this story. That's good. That's good. Any other thoughts? Sorry. <coughs> well, I've got <coughs> 20 minutes, so we'll jump right into chapter 29. So chapter 29, verses 1 through 3, it says, Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped, add year to year, Observe your feasts on schedule. I will bring distress to Ariel, and she will be a city of lamenting and mourning, and she will be like an Ariel to me. I will camp against you, encircling you, and I will set siege works against you, and I will raise up battle towers against you. So now we're really getting into more of the prophecy related to Judah. And Ariel, in this particular case, is the city of Jerusalem, which is located in the southern kingdom. And when I looked at that word Ariel, Ariel sounds like the Hebrew word for hearth or altar. And um, so in Jerusalem, one of the things that you saw was that the altar was constantly covered with the blood of the sacrifice. Even though it was clean, the sacrificial blood soaked into the stone. And so what you're going to see here is that God is going to reference Jerusalem as being the hearth or the altar where the blood of the sacrifice is actually going to be forthcoming. Again, this is, as you said, it's, it's uh, pre-exile for Judah. And he's beginning now to prophesy about what will happen to the Judeans. And he's essentially telling them, look, if, if we don't shape up, um, God's going to sacrifice them in judgment just like he has the people in the northern kingdom. And it says the enemy will begin to build siege works and circle the walls with battle towers. Um, I mean, one of the things I thought about is, even though that's a literal, he's talking literally about battle works being surrounding the city on a spiritual basis, I think one of the things that you can take away from this is, is that many of us feel like these siege works and these battle towers surround us because of our circumstances, because of anxiety. Um, the last lesson I did in my class in third quarter was about um, come to me all, you are, all ye who are weary and, and want rest. And so when you talk about that, I think you feel sometimes like you're besieged. And so again, he's talking about this literally, but I also think there's a spiritual component to this. But in this case, the enemy is God. Even though he will use a different instrument, he will use a conquering army. In essence, it is God uh, who is the enemy to the people of Judah who are living in sin, who are not following God and his teaching, and that he sees them potentially as a blood-soaked altar, that sacrifice will be made. Verses 4 through 8, <clears throat> Then you will be brought low, from the earth you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit from the ground, and your speech will whisper from the dust, but the multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust, and the multitude of the ruthless ones like the chaff which blows away. And it will happen instantly, suddenly. From the Lord of hosts you will be punished with thunder and earthquake and loud noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a consuming fire. And the multitude of all the nations who wage war against Ariel, even all who wage war against her and her stronghold, and who distress her will be like a dream, a vision of the night. It will be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he is eating. But when he awakens, his hunger is not satisfied. 
Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he is drinking. But when he awakens, behold, he is faint, and his thirst is not quenched. Thus the multitude of all the nations will be who wage war against Mount Zion. It says here, and, and the prophecy is that Jerusalem will be humbled and will lie prostrate before God. That will be an outcome. Um, had they chosen to listen to God, it may not have been quite as uh, detrimental to them as a people. But one way or another, they will lie prostrate before God. And to me, I took that away in my own life, which is sooner or later, I'm going to be on my knees before God because I can't do it without him. It says their voice will be as a ghost buried in the ground, which I took to mean you can't hear it. That their cries will, will be deafening, but the ground, the dirt above them will, will banish those cries so that God will not hear those cries until his judgment has been leveled against the people of Judah. And I think verse 5 is where you begin to see not only the prophecy on an immediate basis against Judah, but you also begin to see the long-term prophecy of the second coming of Christ. Um, it talks about, uh, well, let's read it. It says, But the multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust. Uh, I don't know about you, but fine dust is almost impossible to get rid of. It covers everything. It gets in the middle of everything. And, um, and I think what he's saying is, is that the enemies are going to be multitudinous and they're going to be very difficult to eradicate. And the multitude of the ruthless ones like the chaff which blows away and it will happen instantly, suddenly. And so the double reference is, first, Assyria will assail Jerusalem and is going to conquer her, which foreshadows that the end of the tribulation when all nations will rise against Israel. So he's talking about here an immediate prophecy of Judah being assailed, but he's also talking about his chosen people Israel also being assailed by all of the nations of the earth at some future point in time. But like dreams of eating or drinking, those nations' hunger will not be satisfied and their thirst will not be quenched because at some point God will relent and he will come to the aid of his people. And I took comfort from that because even when God chastises me or even when God punishes me for my lack of faith, my lack of humility, my pride, my sin... At some point in time, God is going to come back to my aid. Once I've learned the lesson that I need to learn, God will once again, over, uh, his hand will, will come over me in my life. And I think that's a great comfort. And he's again telling the people of Judah, that Israel hasn't learned this lesson yet, but he's telling the people of Judah that at some point in time, his judgment will, will be released and he will come back to the aid of his people. And I think you see here that once the punishment is complete, God once again becomes a powerful resource for his people. Verses 9 through 12. Be delayed and wait. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads, the seers. The entire vision will be to you like the words of a sealed book, which when they give it to the one who is literate, saying, Please read this, he will say, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, Please read this, and he will say, I cannot read. <clears throat> this is where your point about uh, this not being about drunkenness. Yes. This is where. This is where it came from. That's this is the reference. Came. This is where the reference now begins to broaden from very specific uh, words about inebriation, about drunkenness, about partying, about the sin that comes with complete abandonment of any morals, of any standards. Now he's saying, but it's not just drunkenness that. Uh, that I am going to judge. It is also this 
this stumbling around in the dark. I think you put it exactly right. It's yeah, this is where it came from. This yeah. is where my time came from. Yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. And again, though, Isaiah is beginning to say it's we may not have just the issue of drunkenness. We have not yet reached that level. But we can't um, pat ourselves on the back because we're stumbling in the dark just as much as the people of Israel are. And because of the fact that they refuse to hear the word of the Lord, he's pouring out a spirit of deep sleep. He shut their eyes to the prophets. He's covered their heads to the seers. The vision of this has been delivered like a sealed book whose meaning cannot be understood. And it's sealed to those who can read, and it's incomprehensible to those who cannot read. 13 and 14 says, Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Their spiritual blindness manifests from the, from the sense that they rely completely on tradition and strict religion instead of worship. Um, that's one of the things that the current church, I think, struggles with, is that we've somehow lost sight of the heart of God, and instead we focus on the traditions and the religion and the and the things that make us comfortable. And I think back to, for example, a time when uh, there was a point when the church went through a divide between contemporary worship and traditional worship. And we were all focused on the, the things around it, the mechanism of worship, as opposed to looking at God's heart and who was being called as a, as a function of contemporary worship, being a, bringing a whole new generation into the church. I think what he's saying here is, is that the people of Judah and Israel, they're manifesting these traditions and this dogma and this uh, legalism, and that's one of the reasons why they've lost sight of who God is. They only pay lip service. Their hearts are far from him. Again, one of the lessons I took from this is God looks only at the heart. Um, Jesus quotes these verses in Mark 7, 5 through 7, pointing out their hypocrisy. And many in that time became stuck. And so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing what, what we do with the consequences for Judah. And it does say, though, that a time's going to come when God will deal marvelously with his people. And the word marvelously here doesn't mean good. Okay? I think about our nation, and there will come a time when God will deal marvelously with uh, America. We are not God's chosen people. And even though we like to think we are, God's judgment is going to rain down on this country just like it does everybody else who lives in sin. Um, I know we're running out of time. Let me uh, cover 15 and 16. Woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord and those whose deeds are done in a dark place. And they say, who sees us or who knows us? You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, he did not make me. Or what is formed, say to him, who formed it? He has no understanding. Um, part of the plan of Jerusalem was to defend against Assyria by aligning with Egypt. And what God is telling them is, is that Egypt is like a reed that is broken in the wind. They're... They're not trustworthy. They can't be relied upon. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing here to me is that the leaders of Jerusalem are undertaking this, assuming that God doesn't know what they're doing. That he, it talks about being under the cover of darkness. And what this means is, is they think they're hiding their actions from God. God tells them that they've turned things upside down. Is the clay equal to the potter? Do, do the created have the ability to be greater than the creator? That's essentially what he's asking here. Their human pride has led to self-sufficiency. You know, I looked at this as teens are always, always believe they're smarter than their parents. Adults always believe they're smarter than God. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs>